You're listening to a podcast from the University of Manchester. Welcome to a brand new episode of The Buzz. Before we introduce our topic, we are sure you'll agree it's been a tough few weeks. We are determined to keep the podcast going. We think it's important to continue to celebrate the work of our faculty colleagues during this time and to share the best of our research and heritage. We apologise that there may be issues with sound quality, but we hope you enjoy what we have in store over the next few weeks. two of our special podcasts celebrating women in science. This episode, we speak to doctors Christy Turner and Lynn Bianchi about the work being done to patch up that leaky pipeline and encourage more girls to study science and more women to pursue a scientific career. But first, to highlight the gender gap in science, I've put together a fun quiz and I'm challenging Joe and Natalie to go head to head in what some might call the great battle of the sexes. So feel free to play along at home. I'm going to ask you to buzz in with your answer. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. Ready. So question one, what percentage of computer science graduates are female? Yes, Natalie. 10. That is incorrect. Joe, higher or lower? Um, I'm going to go lower. You're wrong. It's 16%. Oh. But still, that's quite, quite small. Yes. Quite a small really percentage. Small. <laughs> okay. What percentage of physics professors are women? Oof. Joe. 19%. I'm afraid, I'm afraid not. Natalie, do you think higher or lower? I think lower. Yep, 6% wow. of physics professors are women. I don't think yes is the <laughs> correct answer, Natalie. Okay. What percentage of employees at CERN are women? And CERN is home of the Large Hadron Collider. Ooh. Natalie. I could say 20 that's bang on. It is 20%. Well done. And also, um, coincidentally, that's also the same percentage of girls who study physics at A-level. Well. Okay, so what percentage of the overall UK STEM workforce is female? So that's anyone working in science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. Ooh. Joe? Okay, Joe? <laughs> I'm going to go for 24%. No. I'm going to say lower. Yep, it's 14%. Oh, wow. But it did lot. reach 1 million for the first time last year, so it is moving upwards, but very slowly. Mm. Still. And do you know what is the gender pay gap within the UK STEM workforce? Um, I'm going to say 20% That's higher again. Yeah, again, bang on, on. 20%. And the gap actually increases with age and experience. Wow. Yeah, bad times. Yeah, okay, so times. let's talk about representation. So in the Times 100 most popular kids books, in how many of those stories is the central protagonist female? Yes, Natalie. I'm going to say 15%. You're very, very close. Ooh. 14%. <laughs> it's actually 19%, oh. but fewer than 1%. Uh, ethnic minorities wow that's crazy yeah okay i've brought this up before but what percentage of nobel prize winners are women yes natalie oh is it eight percent very close again nine percent it's actually six percent oh. and we're going into the last so question low. it is so very low. it's very low it's so low we're going into the last question there's everything to play for even though I haven't kept score at all. <laughs> so it all rests on this nail-biting final question. I'm ready. On Wikipedia, what percentage of biographies are about women? Oh. I think that's quite low. I'm going to go 10%. Close, close. Ta care to take a guess, Natalie? I'll go 11%. Natalie, Natalie's closest is yes. 18%. Oh. And as a fun fact, nine out of 10 Wikipedia editors are men. I'm not saying that's why only 18% of the biographies are about women, but, you know, I'll let you draw your own conclusions. So, not coincidence. No. So 
we know that women are underrepresented in science. Some say this is down to factors like starting a family, which means that women have to take a step back from their career, but then this can apply to any career path. And there are some who even suggest women's brains aren't wired to excel at science, to which I say, that's rubbish. And <laughs> numerous tests have found that actually when it comes to that, it's very uh, minimal differences between boys and girls' brains in the classroom and how they respond to science. But what we do know is that girls and boys show a similar aptitude for science and a similar interest until around the age of 10 or 11. And that's when girls start to drift away from the subject. So, for example, at age 11 and 12, when asked what they would like to do when they grew up, the top five answers given by boys in one survey was footballer, police officer, doctor, firefighter and engineer. And for girls, it was makeup, nails, teacher, model and fashion designer. Wow. So wow. something Quite is different. Yeah, so very different. Stereotypical, like so based that way. It's crazy. Exactly. And um, there's a lot of uh, research to suggest that it can come down to um, gender equality within societies. And kids are getting information all over the place, not just at home and at school, but everywhere. And that informs what they think they're capable of doing and what they want to do um, when they get older. So, uh, you guys spoke to Dr. Lynn Bianchi recently about the great science share and the work she's doing to encourage girls into science. We did. Yes, we did. So let's listen to that now. Hi, I'm here with Dr. Lynn Bianchi, who's the director of the university's Science and Engineering Education Research and Innovation Hub, and is also the campaign director of the great science share for schools. So can you tell us a little more about your role and also a little bit about your background? So my role here at the University of Manchester, as you said, is that very long-winded uh, title. It basically means six years ago, I set up a new unit here within the Faculty of Science and Engineering. Um, we work with in-service teachers across Greater Manchester in particular to um, improve uh, the quality uh, of teaching science in primary schools and lower secondary schools in particular. And obviously that also extends into engineering. Um, and that also then filters out to a sort of a UK and a global remit with our research activity where we're spreading our knowledge and our expertise uh, well beyond the uh, barriers of um, Greater Manchester. Um, so you're the campaign director of the Great Science Share for Schools. Could you tell us a little bit more about that initiative uh, and what are its main aims? Sure. OK, so the Great Science Share for Schools um, very much stems from a long-standing passion since I was a primary teacher myself a good, good number of years ago now. Um, it's set up to inspire uh, young people into uh, science and engineering, as you can imagine, a lot of initiatives like this do. But what's very, very unique about it, I think, is the fact that we focus very much on the child at the centre of all of that and their voice. So children will uh, share their scientific questions and investigations with new audiences it's an annual campaign uh, and we rally towards a campaign date in June this year. It's the 16th of June 2020 uh, and uh, the campaign will be five years old. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, aiming to raise the profile of primary science nationally and internationally. It's aiming to support teachers to improve the way they teach science and, and the time that's offered within the curriculum to teach science. And the third aim is very much to be collaborative and a means by which lots of different organisations, uh, groups, industry partners and educational partners can come together over one mission, which is to make primary science much stronger than it is. Yep, sounds like a great initiative. <laughs> um, so why do you think it's so important that children are involved in science? And do you see any differences when it comes to boys and girls at a, a younger age? I find that question quite a bit of a challenge because I don't. I, I think that children are just scientific from from very early in their life. Yeah. Um, if anything, we do our utmost to take it out of them rather than <laughs> put it in. Um, so just the fact that they're creative and they're curious and they're asking questions and they're touching and they're feeling and they're looking into things, or mostly the things that you don't want them to look into, but they are scientific. Um, so it's it's crucial really that that, that continues. Um, the love for exploring their world um, is. Um, um, is capitalized upon formalized of course because we want you know we want to sort of give them a, a stronger sense of what it means to be a scientist and to have the habits of mind of a scientist so that they can come to amazing institutions like this or into industry at some point in their lives and and have a really flourishing career um 
the boy girl differences um even going back to the when i was in the classroom i've got to say i didn't massively see a difference between boys and girls engagement in science in the primary years i was mainly a junior teacher um i hear of it obviously as a bigger issue at key stage four so when kids are getting you know doing their secondary choices that there was obviously a a renowned and significant drop off of girls especially into areas like physics but at primary i think there is much more equity and uh, equality of provision um you know teachers teaching whole classes uh, where you don't necessarily make distinctions between boys or girls maybe where their interests lie is what the big difference is so some of our projects that we're doing for instance the greater manchester engineering challenge we've found that girls stay engaged for longer when there is a social engineering challenge so if you're saying to people you know how could we make uh, the water cleaner because actually health is impacted if we don't as opposed to um I don't know, make a, uh, build us a marble run like we did one particular year. The boys are loving, you know, will we'll, you know, affiliate more to the mechanical and the electrical, where the girls, when there is that social interest, will use mechanical and electrical, but for purpose to improve people's lives. And that seems to keep them more engaged for longer. It doesn't disengage the boys, but I think just that slight edge to how does that impact on me, my world and people around me, um, is where we do see girls sort of lighting up a little bit more, maybe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah. Um, what particular barriers do you think young people face when studying science or other STEM subjects, um, and in particular in relation to young girls? Sure. Um, for this one, um, on considering this question, I think the biggest barrier for young people uh, in the early years and, and primary years at this time, unfortunately, is our curriculum. Um, there has been extensive pressure from government to ensure that the primary curriculum is solid in the way that it provides uh, um, literacy and numeracy experiences for children, which I'm never going to say otherwise, but it has been at the compromise of the profile and time given to science and STEM subjects. So design technology is nearly non-existent in a lot of schools. Uh, Engineering isn't a subject. Uh, Maths, obviously, is a strength. Science is a third core subject and never has not been, but it is treated as uh, a foundation foundation subject and very much the time has dwindled what the implication of that is is that teachers um, have less time for professional development Uh, money is um, moved more towards the literacy and the numeracy the things where the government are looking more closely so i think that that's the biggest barrier because actually it's not to do with the children it's to do with the time and opportunity that's in front of them and the um inspiration that a teacher has throughout their career to bring you know contemporary science context in the classroom and to have the time and inspiration and support to just keep learning uh, throughout their career so yeah i think that's the biggest challenge girls again you mentioned there i think um yeah i think that if we don't have enough time to teach science and then yeah. we're compounding that with potential gender issues it's just yeah you can imagine where that's going in your own work, what would you say are the biggest inspirations for you? Um, uh, I am a bit of an excitable person, so there are quite a lot of things that uh, inspire me. Um, I love creativity. I love just um, trying to explore problems from lots of different avenues. And I think that's probably why I set Zary up, really. There was a challenge, uh, and I am a bit like a, a dog with a bone there. I, I, I enjoy the challenge. So that, you know, the creative opportunities to find all sorts of different ways to connect with people, to uh, forge collaborations um, right across HE, but also into the civic roles and, and all across the local authority and nationally to look at lots of different options to bring teachers into engaging more with science. That inspires me. When I arrived here, you know, you're, all you have to do is walk down the corridors of this place and you are meeting architects, you're meeting um, materials engineers, you're meeting mechanical engineers, chemical engineers, people who talk about their jobs and you're thinking, oh my word, I used to, used to drive past this building and never quite understand what happened within it. So, yeah, I think people are the biggest inspiration to me. And from that, then can stem projects and collaborations and everything else that comes. Yeah, yeah. fantastic. Um, so looking ahead to the future, um, what are your hopes for um, the future for young people in science? And again, especially for girls. Uh huh. Um, my hope, and I think I've always been quite solid in this, is that, that young people and especially girls have a chance to 
discover science um, from an early age so that they can make a clear choice. Um, if they've got a rich experience, they can then decide, okay, I've had a, a quality experience of learning this subject or this range of subjects that connects. And actually, I really feel affili affiliated to those. And I, I'd like to take that through to uh, ongoing study and beyond. Some children might go, you know, I've had that rich experience and actually I don't feel it's me. I, you know, I, I'm moving in a slightly different direction. Um, but if we don't give them the chance to make, you know, an informed choice from the, from an early age, they're going to struggle. So my hope is that every young child, wherever they might be, has an inspirational teacher who is well supported by their leadership team, a curriculum and a, and a landscape out there that is, um, yeah, supporting contemporary science and engineering and what that looks like nowadays because times change. Um, and then through that, they can then make an adequate choice of, do they want to be scientists and engineers in the future and drive drive change in that way? Or do they want to use their skills in different ways? Because I think scientific skills can be applied right across all sorts of jobs. It doesn't necessarily just have to make you a scientist or an engineer uh, per se. Definitely. Um, and final question, uh, do you have a favourite female scientist who you would love to have a chat with? I think I would have to go back and find a young girl called Isabel uh, from a school in North Manchester. I spoke to her when she was eight and I asked her what um, what she was wondering about and if she would share that with me. Uh, it was part of a project called Working Wonders and it was supported by one of um, our very good charities, which is the Primary Science Teaching Trust. And I remember Isabel saying to me what she wondered about was how did a calculator calculate so amazingly fast and always get the right answer? <laughs> So I think I'd like to go back to Isabel and say, you know, it'll probably be about five years ago. Five years on, has that wondering stuck with her? <laughs> yeah. Has she sorted that out in her head? Has she found <laughs> out? Is she still wondering about it? Because I think it's the absolutely brilliant wondering to have. I'm not in the end. <laughs> so I think that would be my female scientist <laughs> that I'd like to talk to. Thank you. What a great way to end. Thanks very much. No problem. Thank, Thank you very much for the chance. Now it's time for a brand new feature on The Buzz. Each episode, we want to hear your kids' science and engineering questions. We'll pass these on to our own engineers and scientists for the answer. Who knows? By the time the schools reopen, your little ones could be the next Brian Cox or Danielle George. Send your questions to fsemarketing at manchester.ac.uk or to any of our social media platforms. Kids of all ages can get involved. And first up, we have this from Clara, age five. How the birds fly. Hopefully we'll have the answer to Clara's question in the next episode. Hi, we're here with Dr Christy Turner, who works as a teaching fellow here at the University of Manchester in the Department of Chemistry, but also has the unique position of teaching chemistry in a high school. Christy, thanks for joining us today. Hello. Um, could you tell me a bit, little bit more about your role here at the university and in teaching in the high school? So as you say, I do have a unique role. Um, I currently work two days a week in a high school and three days a week here in the university. I've actually been a qualified teacher for 14 years. Um, this is my fifth year doing this. Um, I designed this role myself because I was particularly interested in how students transfer between school and university in chemistry. Um, so I had a bit of a braver moment when I asked both the university and my school would they be prepared to share me. <laughs> and thankfully they were quite open-minded and optimistic about it and decided that we would go for it. And it must be working because I'm still here. <laughs> um, so in a week I can move from teaching 12-year-olds um, and then the next day be working with my uh, fourth year research students who are doing research in chemistry education. So I could have a really varied week. Uh, so what sparked your early interest in science and chemistry in particular? I don't think I really have any, I can't really put my finger on what particular part of my life has made me follow a, a career in science and chemistry. I've got a few really strong memories from primary school and I, and I do think that they were quite influential. I do remember, and it is quite random, that I was taken on a trip to the Reflecting Road Studs 
factory, which wow. was up the road from my school, <laughs> um, which makes the cat's eyes that go on the motorway. Um, and I remember being there and they were talking about rubber and vulcanisation of rubber, which is a weird thing for an eight-year-old to know about. Yep. Um, but that really sticks in my mind. And I also remember having a really good primary school teacher who actually did lots of experiments, which I think are quite rare sometimes in primary science. And now, as a teacher, I know this is a very classic experiment that you give to students where you give them a candle and a jar and they put the jar on the candle um, and see what happens. And she must have left us for more than an hour trying to figure out why this candle went out because at the time we knew nothing. We hadn't been taught anything beforehand. There were lots of discussions about why it happened and everything. Um, and that time just spent exploring it really had an impact on me as well that it, I was finding out answers. So that really stuck with me. And with chemistry compared to the other sciences, it was one of these things where every time I studied some chemistry, there were always more questions. Whereas with other subjects, I kind of felt that that was done. I'd learned that stuff and it was done. Whereas with chemistry, it was always, I had a really good teacher who would always be saying things like, oh, well, when you do A-levels, then you'll find, the, find out that this is not quite true. Mm. And then that was the same when we were doing A-levels. And to a certain extent, that was the same when I was doing my degree, which is why I carried on to do a PhD as well. Mm. So I think that's why chemistry was much more engaging for me than the other subjects. So what are your experiences of being a female academic in science? Um, have you experienced barriers or discrimination? I don't really think I have. Um, or if I have, I've not noticed. Maybe that, that could be the case. I know certainly after my PhD, I was really put off becoming an academic. It seemed like um, a job that would never end, that would have too much of an impact on my life. So it's strange that I then accidentally ended up as an academic. <laughs> um, I think what I feel most in terms of frustration with being a female academic is not actually necessarily linked to being female, but um, a, a view that chemistry education, which actually do get a lot of women working in, um, is not a subdivision or a subfield of chemistry, and that um, essentially the study of chemistry education uh, as an academic is less worthy than somebody who's doing something in a lab, um, because that isn't helpful. It's not a very helpful divide, the, the divide between people who are involved in teaching and scholarship and those that are involved in, involved in pure research. Mm. Do you think there are barriers to see more women and girls in science in general studying STEM subjects? Do you see that in, especially in younger girls from maybe a primary school or high school going on to do more science subjects? To start with, I don't think STEM is a very helpful term, actually, um, because actually it's a very big catch-all term, and we've got lots of women who study biological sciences and medicine and things like that. And I do think sometimes making those big generalisations actually detracts away from the message we're trying to put across. Mm -hmm. There are very serious issues, but if we just use a big term like STEM, I actually think we lose some of the impact of what we're trying to say. Um, I would say that a lot of it comes from early education. Um, we do a lot of work with girls in secondary schools um, but actually by then it, it's fairly well known that their minds may have been made up that they're not going to go that way um, I think a lot happens in very early education before girls are even able to articulate their feelings so these kind of ideas that they don't belong in particular professions because mm. of uh, messages they're getting from social cues around them like TV yeah. and things like that the whole culture of pink yeah. um, I don't think is very helpful so what do you think we can do to overcome these barriers? Uh, I know you mentioned the, the term STEM there. Is there any other way you see that we might be better able to label it or is labelling the wrong way to go? I do think labelling is the wrong way to go, um, to be honest. I think culturally we do need to take a long, hard look at ourselves. The UK has got a terrible attitude towards maths. Um, in general, almost a kind of pride at being poor at maths, mm. um, whereas you wouldn't necessarily be freely admitting that you couldn't read. Um, mm. But that that does hold a lot of people back because maths is one of the languages of science um i think we need to invest in early education we need to invest in working with parents and with childminders and nurseries so that we get a much more gender equal experience for very young children before they're able to talk about what they know mm. once they can talk about it and say oh um i can't be a firefighter because i'm a girl mm. then you can start to challenge that but too often they're forming those views before they're even able to talk about them. Can you see the culture changing? I think there has been a huge shift. Um, I've got a daughter um, and she's very anti-pink <laughs> and she's um, very into things that perhaps would be considered to be more 
um, male dominated things. She loves steam trains. She loves engineering and maths and things like that. Um, so I do think there are some really great things going on. The issue is that it's just taking so much time for anything to happen. Um, we have degrees here at the university in STEM subjects that are 50-50 as far as the gender divide is concerned. Mm. But once you start moving through the pipeline towards PhDs, postdocs, into academia, and then through to professors, then we're losing women. And there is far too much of an impact that uh, maternity leave and flexible working is having on women's careers. So you don't see very many women professors. You don't see very many women who progress through to management and industry. It's not just an academic yeah. problem. Um, but I do think there's lots and lots of movement. There's lots of advocacy happening at the moment, which is brilliant. It's just that the pace of change is still very, very, very slow. Um, so moving on to your own work, what would you say inspires you in, in your work? Really, it's the students that I work with. Um, it is an incredible privilege to spend their formative years with young people. Um, I think people have very poor impressions about what students are like from the ages of 11 upwards and horrible teenagers and things like that. And yeah, they can be challenging, um, but you can have such an influence on them. And because I've had quite a long career in, in teaching now, I meet my former students in lots of walks of life. Um, some have become chemistry teachers, some are in the army. Um, it's, and it's really nice to see the impact that you had. And sometimes you don't see that for a long time. You, it's very rare you get a student come back after a year and say, oh yeah, you were brilliant, you had such an impact. But five years, 10 years down the line, then you're much more likely to meet them in the supermarket or see them at a, an event and, and them actually be able to, to articulate that to you in a sensible way as well. And the final question, um, do you have a favourite female scientist? Um, it is a historical figure. Um, last year, I became aware of a Manchester chemistry graduate called Rona Robinson. And if you go to the chemistry building, you can see a poster that we made of her. Um, I was actually walking along a corridor on the way to a tutorial, and I noticed a picture on the wall, and it was from 1905, and it was very typically lots of men in dark suits, and there was a woman on the front row. So I took a picture of it, because it had the names underneath, and I did a bit of research about her. Um, so it turned out that she was the first woman in the UK to get a first class on degree in chemistry wow. uh, which is amazing mm. but she was also a suffragette oh, um, and she was in prison she went on hunger strike wow. um, she spent a very long career in the dyes and pigments industry um, and she's considered one of the first female industrial chemists as well um, so I'd love to talk to her and find out what Manchester was like then yeah. um, and what it was like to be studying alongside these 40 or so men and be the only woman because to me she was a true pioneer So that's all for this episode of The Buzz, but we'll be back soon with a brand new episode. For further information on what you've heard today, visit our website at manchester.ac.uk forward slash the buzz, where you'll also find links to all our social media. And if you have any questions about today's episode, our email is fsemarketing at manchester.ac.uk. You can follow the faculty on Instagram and Twitter at UOM and search for our Facebook page and YouTube account. See you next time.